What beautiful music this morning. So powerful, so beautiful. So thankful to be out here with you on this parking lot today. To open God's Word, please turn to the book of 1 John, 1 John chapter 5, and then turn to the book of Jude. It's just a few pages over uh, from 1 John. It's the one chapter letter that is right before the book of Revelation. And so what we're going to do for the next three weeks, we're going to take a pause from our study in Proverbs, and we're going to study the book of Jude. And so here's what this means. In the last uh, few years, this Twin Lakes Baptist Church has been dedicated to studying through books of the Bible. And I spoke with Derek last night, and he wanted me to reiterate to you how much he loves this church that they've never been treated so well anywhere in their ministry as in Twin Lakes Baptist Church. And he and Teresa, are he's recovering from COVID, and so they're home today. And uh, let's just give a honk out to our co-pastor Derek and Teresa Grigg, all right? And <clears throat> so since we started with our sermon-based Bible studies, we have now studied in this church 1 Thessalonians, Philippians, 1 John, 1 Peter, Revelation that Dave taught, Dave Alfrey taught over at the Young at Heart Ministry, the book of Acts that Daryl Young taught over there as well. Uh, we're going through Proverbs and now the letter of Jude. And what that means is when we complete Jude and Proverbs, we will have gone through 12% of the Bible. At this rate, it's going to take us eight years to go through the Bible. Now, I need a commitment from every one of you on the parking lot, those of you in the auditorium, and those of you who are watching online, I need a commitment that you're going to live at least another eight years so we can get through the Bible. How do you like that? Come on. Absolutely. Only interrupted if the Lord Jesus Christ returns from heaven and takes us home, right? That would be a glorious interruption. And so we want to study through the Word of God. That's what this church is committed to, to studying through the Bible, studying through the Word of God. Now then, Jude is a very interesting little letter. My friend, it is power-packed. It, it, it is strong. And Jude has a very interesting perspective on the times he's living in, on the spread of Christianity, and on the power of Christianity. And why is that? Jesus Christ had four earthly brothers and a few sisters. You see, after Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, Joseph and Mary did what all families did in those days, they tried to have as many children as they possibly could. And there was a very pragmatic reason for that as well as a familiar reason. The familial reason is that everybody loves family. Everybody that loves God loves children and wants to see more of them. But the practical reason was there was no retirement. There was no Social Security there was no pension. There, there, you, you worked till you died, and if you became disabled and unable to work, you had to depend upon your children. And therefore, the more you had, the more likely you were to be well taken care of. So Joseph and Mary, after the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, had a number of children. There were four brothers. And those brothers were James, who became the first pastor of the first church in Jerusalem. And then after James, there was Jude or Judah, as he's called in Hebrew. And Jude or Judah was also well recognized because those two wrote letters that appear in the New Testament. 
And then there was a brother named Simon and a brother named Joseph. And they're mentioned in other places in the scriptures. And, and so Jude has this unusual perspective on the gospel because Jude grew up in the household with Jesus. Now, something very interesting to know about his brothers and sisters. They didn't like him. Did you ever have a perfect sibling and your parents ever said to you, why can't you be like Joe, Jim, Bob, Sally, or Lucy? And that is the most irritating thing you can say to a child. We should never say that to our children. But I tell you what, if you grew up in Jesus' household, then I'm telling you, you grew up in a household where people were, that the family was focused on a perfect person. And that perfect person was none other than Jesus Christ. And why do I say they didn't like him? Because when Jesus said, I'm going to go up to the feast in Jerusalem before his crucifixion, they said, why don't you go ahead and go? Even though they knew he had violent enemies there waiting on him. And so they said, well, just go ahead and go. You're creating so much trouble here in the community anyway. Why don't you just go ahead and go? And then something happened. He went, and the Lamb of God entered into the city of Jerusalem, and he was crucified outside the city of Jerusalem, and he was placed in a borrowed tomb. And everybody heard about it. Everybody that knew Jesus was sorrowful and mournful and sad. But then something amazing happened on that Sunday morning 2,000 years ago that we call Easter Sunday morning. On that morning, Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. And it changed the world. It changed your life. That event changed my life. That event changed the life of James and Jude and Joseph and Simon and those sisters and Mary. Because then they realized he was who he claimed to be. He was not deluded. He was not a lunatic. He was not a deceiver. He was truly the virgin-born Son of God, and the resurrection sealed that for all of eternity. Amen? Amen. And so now Jude is writing a letter. And he says, look, I wanted to write to you and talk to you about the Messiah. But we have an urgent problem. And I need to get this letter out to you quickly. And that urgent problem is that we have false teachers that are perverting the gospel of my brother who I saw who was crucified, buried, and rose again. They are perverting his message. And this one little letter of Jude talks about false teachers and the things that they were trying to do to confuse people for their own self-gratification and for their own financial reward. And so Jude wrote to correct that. And in the process, he gave us three powerful truths we're going to focus on for the next three Sundays. First of all, he told us how we can keep from stumbling, how we can keep from falling, how we can know that we're going to heaven, and how our salvation is secure and eternal. And secondly, he talked about the second coming of Jesus Christ. And then thirdly, he talked about sharing your faith and the importance of sharing your faith. Now this Sunday, we're going to talk about security. Next Sunday, we're going to talk about the second coming right here on this parking lot. And maybe it'll happen next Sunday from this parking lot. Be here, all right? Be here. And, and, and then on Labor Day weekend, Daryl Young, hopefully will be in the auditorium, will preach about, I speak Jesus or sharing your faith. And those are the three powerful messages of Jude. And so let's read first over in 1 John chapter 5, and let's read these powerful scriptures about our salvation and the eternal nature of our salvation. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 11. Are you ready? And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. 
I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us and whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. And so John, that disciple who alone was at the cross, that disciple who also wrote 2 John and 3 John in the book of Revelation, wanted us to know something. He wanted us to know that, my friend, listen to me very carefully. If you have trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you have turned from your sin and your self-will and your attempt at good works, and you have turned and repented of all that and said to Jesus, Jesus, I'm trusting in you and you alone, then John wanted us to know you are eternally secure and nothing can ever take that salvation from you. And my friend, I don't care how many wars there are. I don't care how many rumors of wars there are. I don't care how many famines, how many hurricanes hit Southern California or Florida or anywhere else, how many tornadoes tear through the, the Midwest. I, I don't care how many outbreaks of COVID that we have. I, it doesn't make any difference as far as your salvation is concerned what the stock market does tomorrow or how secure our finances are or who is elected as the next president. That has nothing to do with your salvation. It doesn't make any difference how well you are today and how good you feel or how sick you are today and how bad that you feel. It doesn't make any difference about your past your present, or your future, what you have done, what you are doing right now, or what you will do. My friend, if you're a child of God, we have a relationship that gives us the utmost confidence and security and foundation. And let me just tell you this. There is nothing in this world that is sure that's 100% that is absolutely secure, nothing in this world. Your health will fail you. Your body will fail you. Your mind will fail you. Friends will fail you. Your money will fail you. Your influence will fail you. Your popularity will fail you. But I want you to know this. Jesus will never fail you. Amen? Never. Never. And that's what Jude wants us to know, and that's what John wants us to know. So look at Jude, verse 1. It's only one chapter. Jude, verse 1. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once delivered to all the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now let's look at what Jude has written here. First of all, he says, I'm Jude, and notice he does not say, and I want you to listen to me because I want to tell you something. I come from a very unique family. My pedigree is unusual. I have a family like no other family, and I want you to listen to me because of that. He could have said, look, there's nobody else in the world other than my brothers and my sisters who could say, that they were born of Mary, who was the mother of Jesus in the miracle of the virgin birth. And so he could have said, you listen to me because of my position in this world. I'm a powerful man. Jesus Christ was my earthly brother. And because of my position, 
You listen to me. Matter of fact, I want my name out on the sign. I want my name on the billboard. I want everybody to call my name. I want to get millions of hits on social media. I want everybody in Jerusalem to talk about me because I'm the brother of Jesus. I hold here in my hands this morning. Bill Dale just dropped this off to me. A book written by Bill O'Reilly called Killing the Legends. Killing the Legends. And the subtitle is The Lethal Danger of Celebrity. The Lethal Danger of Celebrity. And there's a picture of John Lennon and Elvis Presley and Muhammad Ali on the front cover. Now, Gary Kareeb and I were talking last night. And we were talking about a lot of different things, but Gary was talking about people who just could not handle popularity. And he said, Sam, I've seen it over and over again. I've seen people who became very powerful and very popular, and their lives cratered, and they tanked, and they didn't end well. And I said, Gary, why is that? And Gary said, Sam, I'll tell you what the, my friend told me. He said, my friend told me that human beings are not designed to be worshipped. Did you hear that? Human beings are not designed to be worshipped by the masses. And it causes destruction in the life and in the mind, in the personality, in the outlook, in the decision-making of those who feel like the whole world is worshiping me and they don't realize that that's for a fleeting moment because one day nobody remembers your name. You go from being a hero to a zero. Jude didn't say that. You know what Jude called himself here? Jude said, at all costs, I'm going to avoid the destruction of celebrity. I am not a celebrity. Here's what he calls himself. He says, I am a servant of Jesus Christ. A servant. The Greek words are bond slave. I am a slave, brother. I'm not using my brother's family reputation to buy influence. I'm not using my family name so that I might have an audience. He said, I am a bond slave of Jesus Christ. He humbled himself. And my friend, to follow after God, we must be people who say we are bond slaves of Jesus Christ. We serve him. We are servants. It's not that, hey, I've got a theology degree. I've got a, a church to pastor. I've got a business to run. A lot of people know my name. I've got a big bank account. Hey, I, I'm the Teflon Don. I'm impenetrable. No one can get through to me. Now, my friend, Jesus said the greatest among you is the servant of all. And Jesus also said this. He, he said that those who follow after the path of pride will certainly fall into the pit of destruction. We have to check ourselves. We don't need to be a celebrity anywhere. We don't need to be a celebrity in our church. We don't need to be a celebrity in our community. We don't need to be a celebrity in this world. We don't need to be a celebrity in our own household. You see, some people just can't admit that they're ever wrong. And they want their own household to make them a celebrity, their own family to make them a celebrity. Listen, my friend, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen? There are none of us who are celebrities. No, we're all sinners in need of a Savior. And that's what Jude says. He said, I am a servant of Jesus Christ, and I'm the brother of James. And James said the same thing. He said, I'm a bond slave of Jesus Christ, and therefore I'll serve him. The greatest among you is the servant of all. I will serve Jesus. And my friend, that should be our attitude today. And you're exhibiting that by being on this parking lot. You are representing that over there in the auditorium. 
And you're exhibiting that by watching this service online. You are saying, I want to know Jesus. I want to serve Jesus. I want to live for Jesus. My life is focused on Jesus. Thank God for this little letter of Jude. We're going to learn a lot. But you say, Sam, wait a minute. You said something pretty bold to start this message today. You said, no matter what we do, no matter what we do, past, present, or future, if we are a child of God, we're going to go to heaven. Now, what's that all about? Well, you guys have heard of plea deals a lot lately. Plea deals, where someone who has done something that is wrong, and yes, before we all cast stones at other people, first, let's look in the mirror. Amen? We have all done something or many things that are wrong. And recently, a very popular plea deal came forward, and that plea deal went before a judge here on this earth. And that judge said, I'm not going to allow this plea deal to go through because it is, it is absolving the appellee of all past wrongdoing, all present wrongdoing, and all future wrongdoing. And under the law, I can't do that. Did you hear that? Under the law, I can't do that. And yes, we live under the law here in the United States of America. And how many of you are thankful for that flag today and thankful for the great country that God has given us? We live by the rule of law. We're not going to go to Walmart after church and smash and grab, are we? Amen? We're not going to do that. We live under the rule of law. But I want to tell you something. And listen, glory hallelujah, you might want to stand on the roof of your car. We're not living under law. We are living under the grace of God. Amen? They say, wait a minute, Sam. If you're saying that I'm saved today and I can go out and do anything I want to do and I will stay saved, then man, I'll just go out and live it up and I'll just do whatever I want to do and I'll still go to heaven. You know, let me tell you how well that works. Let me tell you how well that works. If you're a child of God, underline the word child. Underline the word child. I know what it means to be a child. I was the child of Joe Bailey. Big, stout, strong, concrete finisher. Gentle man. Godly man. Wonderful man. But when Sam Bailey went out and broke the law of Joe Bailey, I received the administration of the paddle of compassion to the seat of justice. Joe Bailey would lay it on me. And in school, so would Mr. Park and Mr. Martin and Mr. Bush and Mr. Sellers. They, they would all, hey, we, if we violated what was right, there was a price to be paid. Now, friend, before you turn your liberty as a Christian into the license to sin, before you turn your liberty as a Christian into the license to sin, let me remind you of this. Sin will carry you farther than you want to go. Sin will cost you more than you want to pay. And sin will keep you longer than you want to stay. There are consequences for sin. Yes. There's heartache and there's heartbreak and, 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 and there's, there's a broken heart and there's all kinds of consequences to our sin. But let me tell you one consequence that is not there. If you've given your life to Jesus, one consequence of sin is you will never lose your salvation. But God will not let a child of God go too far. I really believe, I've seen this, I've witnessed this, and I say this carefully and cautiously. Please. John wrote about it. John wrote about it. There is a sin unto death. My friend, don't you think you can go out and just do anything you want to do, any way you want to do it, anywhere you want to do it, with anybody you want to do it with, and not realize we serve a holy, righteous, just God, and He is to be revered. His name is to be adored. And how we live our life makes a difference. 
It makes a difference. Oh, I've had a lot to repent of, my friend. But starting right now, this day, standing on this manhole cover, on this church property, I want to publicly confess to you that I want to walk straighter, I want to shout louder, I want to live better, I want to tell more people about Jesus. Why? Because Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. And I don't want to break his heart. I don't want to break his heart. How do we know we're saved? How do we know that we're kept by the power of God? If you look at your sermon notes, we are saved and we are kept because that's the purpose of God. He saved you for one purpose, to make you more like his son every day you're on this planet. And then when you die to take you to heaven, where we can for all of eternity say, it's going to be like one giant parking lot service. Amen. And there'll be hot dogs everywhere, Karsten and Cindy. I mean, we're going to be celebrating and feasting and adoring and worshiping the Lord forever. It's the power of God that keeps us saved. John said this. He said, no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father, we are one. They are my sheep, the sheep of my pasture. And no one can take them out of my Father's hand. The power of God. My friend, you're not holding on to God by your power. God is holding on to you by His infinite power and His attitude toward His children. What is the attitude of God toward His children? What's well, seen in the prodigal son. We've all been a prodigal son or a prodigal daughter. We've all wandered away from God. But He told that story in the book of Luke to remind us that if we'll come home, he'll throw a party. There'll be a party in heaven. If you as a child of God have wandered away from God and you come home, my friend, if you come home, his attitude is, I'll receive you. We'll kill the fatted calf. I'm going to take care of you. Yeah, he did some things that brought shame to the family name, but guess what? I'm bigger than that. And my grace is more powerful than that. And where sin abounds, the grace of God does much more abound. It is seen in the adoption. This adoption is irre irrevocable. It cannot be altered. When you got saved, you were adopted into the family of God. And because it's based on a covenant, it can never be changed. Why do we know we're secure forever? because of the efficacy of the substitutionary death of Jesus on the cross. What does that mean, efficacy? It means Jesus paid it all. All to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but His blood washed it white as snow. Glory, hallelujah. You see, it's all about the blood of Jesus. Our salvation is based on that blood which the book of Acts tells us that when shed from the cross of Calvary, it is the blood of God. It blows me away. It melts me more out here than that sun above does. That God would give His blood to save a sinner like me. Oh, my friend, always value the blood of Jesus Christ beyond anything else because it's by the blood we're going to go to heaven. It's by the blood that we are saved. The work of Jesus, it's efficacious. It meets the need. It satisfies the wrath of God through the substitutionary death of Jesus. Now, Hebrews chapter 6 is very interesting. In Hebrews chapter, chapter 6, it says this. I'll quote it so you have to turn there. For it is impossible. Now look, notice the word impossible. For it is impossible for those who have been enlightened, who have tasted of the Holy Spirit of God, who have experienced the power of the Word of God. That's a Christian. The Holy Spirit's in you. You have tasted of the goodness of God. You've been saved. It is impossible the author of Hebrews said, if they shall fall away, to renew them again into repentance, seeing that they have crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh, and they've put Him to an open shame. Now what does that mean? That means this. 
If you could be saved today and lost tomorrow, then Jesus would have to die tomorrow again on the cross to save you again. And when the author of Hebrews says we put Jesus to an open shame when we believe that, then we're saying, Jesus, your death on the cross 2,000 years ago, your blood and your resurrection was not enough for me. It was not enough for me because I've sinned again. Now go do it again. Go do it again. Go do it again. My friend, once for all, Christ Jesus died for sinners. Once for all. And that's why we know we are saved eternally. I was talking to my cousin, David Bailey, last night in Atlanta, Georgia. And David was telling me he grew up in a church where you could be saved today and lost tomorrow. He said, finally, I just gave up on it. I finally just gave up on it. And he was at the University of Central Arkansas with a guy named Bill Hughes, who's preaching down at New Hope Baptist Church in Yellville today. He was in... The University of Central Arkansas was called State Teachers College back then, Conway, Arkansas. And he went into a fraternity. And Dick King and Bill Hughes and others showed David how that Jesus saves us and keeps us saved. And he said, Sam, there was absolutely nothing like it when I understood I'm kept alive and saved by the work of God. We are saved eternally because of the sealing work of the Holy Spirit. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit with that seal of God which cannot be broken and the Holy Spirit will remain with you until you die. You are saved because of the nature of the new covenant made in His blood. Emphasize that again, in His blood. A covenant in its most general sense is a solemn promise to engage in or refrain from a specific action. More specifically, a covenant in contrast to a contract is a one-way agreement whereby the covenanter is the only party bound by the promise. My friend, other people can divorce you. Other people can break up the business relationship. Other people can legally walk away from you. Other people can contractually Sue you or do whatever they want to do. If they've got a good enough lawyer, and they can pay enough money. Okay? Because a contract is a two-way street. And they can accuse you that you haven't fulfilled your end of the promise. You're not the woman I married. You're not the man I married. You haven't held up to your end of the deal. You're not the business partner I thought you were. You've lied. You've cheated. You've stolen. They can accuse you of all sorts of things. And they can of bad things about you. And they can break the contracts that exist on this earth. But let me tell you something. Your salvation is not a contract. Your salvation is a covenant. The book of Hebrews tells us this plainly. And that covenant is a one-way agreement. And it's based upon the credibility and the love and the glory and the grace and the strength and the power and the knowledge of the Almighty God And he has said, I've loved you with an everlasting love, eternal life. We are saved continuously because of the continual intercession and advocacy of Jesus. My friend, right now today, as I preach on this parking lot, Jesus Christ stands on your behalf and advocates on your behalf. He's standing before the Father and he's applying the blood to your account which means you're at, right now you're cleaner than a newborn baby. Go to him and thank him for that today. Go to him and confess your sins. Agree with him and say, Jesus, thank you. That even though I've been unfaithful, you're faithful. And thank you that you keep me. And I can count on that. We're eternally saved because of the eternal nature of salvation. He who has the Son has life. Period. Period the eternal nature of salvation, and we're saved because of the believer's heavenly perfection. What does that mean? God doesn't see you as a sinner today. He sees you as a saint. If you like being called a saint, honk your horn. Amen. When God looks at you, he doesn't see all the problems and the mess and the difficulty and the blow-ups and the foul-ups and the stumbling around. Oh, no. He sees you as his child. And he loves you. And I'll tell you something. 
I think you're a committed child of God because you waited in this parking lot for this amount of time for this message. Give God the praise, amen? Give God the glory. Praise the Lord. Now, would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Every head is bowed and every eye is closed. Those of you who are watching online, please join us in this prayer. Let's just say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your great love for me. Thank you that I'm secure. Thank you that I'm saved. Thank you that I'm going to heaven. And my friend, if you're not sure you're saved and secure and going to heaven, then pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I give you my heart. I want what Sam preached about today. I want to know I'm going to heaven. Please forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. Thank you for your blood. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. God bless you. Wow, what a great day. Now, like I said, as our praise team is coming out to sing, and they're going to sing you off the parking lot today, uh, as I said, don't forget next Sunday, it's going to be a whole lot cooler. It's going to be at least 20 degrees cooler than it is right now. When we start, it'll probably be 25 degrees cooler. And so we'll have another great service in the parking lot. Now, one more thing to know. Because we can spread out in the auditorium, we're going to go to the auditorium on Wednesday night. You've heard that we're going to be on the parking lot Wednesday night. But the Bible study on prophecy will be in the auditorium because it's going to be 103 degrees probably when we would start out here. And so I think it'd be better if we go to the auditorium Wednesday night. Are you with me on that? Hey, hey, now if you'll tell somebody else next week about this service, would you blow your horn right now? And let's get folks out here. Let's fill up this parking lot next week.